subscribe tag tv youtube channel and press the notification button why khalistan map not including any part of pakistani punjab since that part should be more sacred to religious aspirations of khalistan why khalistan is never mention 1947 genocide of over quarter million six since this partition was demanded by muslims why khalistani leaders praise pakistan and say they will defend pakistan in a war against india why do khalistani leaders in canada appear with pakistani diplomats and show their solidarity with them Here we have joined hands is much more closer to pakistan than any other country in that world such are the questions arise in context of terry milleski report khalistan a project of pakistan when we witness khalistani leaders in canada saying openly six join hands with pakistan what does that mean when khalistani leaders attend pakistan independence day as guest speakers in an event arranged by a conservative senator of pakistani origin ms salma ataullah jan i like to extend my sincere thanks to our own canadian senator salma ataullah jan salma ataullah jan ko ek baar fir mera dhanwaad karda ਤੇ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਰੈਜ਼ੋਲੂਸ਼ਨ ਡੇ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਮੌਕੇ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਦੋ ਭਾਈਚਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਕੱਠਾ ਕੀਤਾ ਸੋ ਤੀਸਰਾ ਜੋ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਗੁਲਾਮ ਬਣਾ ਕੇ ਰੱਖਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਉਹ ਦੇਖ ਲਵੇ ਕਿ ਵੀ ਹੈਵ ਜੁਆਇਨ ਹੈਂਡਸ ਕੈਨੇਡੀਅਨ ਸਿੱਖ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਇਸ ਮਚ ਮੋਰ ਕਲੋਜ਼ਰ ਟੂ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਥੈਨ ਐਨੀ ਅਦਰ ਕੰਟਰੀ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਵਰਲਡ the spirit and message of khalistani leaders are clear that they apparently work for pakistani project it's far more moving when a stateless nation comes and says happy pakistan to a nation that already has their home so ek bari fir main tohanu ਇੱਕ ਸਟੇਟਲੈਸ ਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਨੁਮਾਇੰਦਾ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਤੇ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈਪੀ ਪਾਕਿਸਤਾਨ ਡੇ। ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਆਸ ਕਰਦਾ ਕਿ ਇੱਕ ਦਿਨ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਵੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਹੈਪੀ ਖਾਲਸਤਾ ਮਾਫ ਕਰਨਾ ਖਾਲੀ ਥਾਵਾਂ ਡੇ ਜਿਹਨੂੰ ਕਹਿ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ। well-known khalistani leader wrote a letter to pakistan's prime minister imran khan and pledged his support to pakistan in case india and pakistan go on war terry milleski is not wrong here in his assertion based on his 35 years experience working on air india bombing and its aftermath i'm joined with dr shivendra dhar dwidi He is an anesthesiologist and national president Canada India Global Forum. Welcome Dr. Saab. You are from Montreal and uh, thank you for joining us today. We'll thank be talking much, about political correctness in Canada in broader context as well as uh, this particular paper um, presented by a very a senior journalist Terry Melaski so what is your take on this paper first of all well i think it's a very uh, remarkable paper uh, it's there's uh, a lot of work that's gone into this and it addresses a very uh, significant topic that is 
being faced by not just Indo-Canadians, but all Canadians, uh, because this is a matter which doesn't just concern Indo-Canadians, the Sikh community, but it's of great concern to Canadians, uh, to all Canadians in all walks of life. So I think it's a very timely paper, and it's something that deserves to be looked at in detail. And I would urge everyone to please uh, read the report uh, before uh, making up their minds. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, some of the Sikh groups they responded to this paper, and the website appeared is called Six Scholars Response. Probably you have seen that letter they have published on the website, and uh, it claims uh, uh, signatures from 50 academia uh, professors, scholars uh, of Sikh background. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I have to uh, I have to tell you that I haven't read that letter, or I have not seen what they have written. Uh, but my first response, and it's not really fair because I haven't read the letter, to be fair. But this is not an academic report, number one. So uh, to criticize a report, which is a, a public in, in the form of public debate, using academic criteria, is technically wrong. Number one, um, I think to 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 be fair, each individual who is who is would be looking at this subject, I would recommend please read Terry's rep, uh, report. Look at his references. He's given the references at the end of that report, and make up your own minds uh, of uh, what is he what he's saying. Is it valid or not? Um, instead of relying on a group, on, on somebody else's opinion. If 50 people decide to put their name on a particular uh, report, what is their interest in putting their on a report like this? Otherwise, criticizing for criticism's sake, you know, that's, that's just a game. I mean, that's, there's no validity to that. So that was, that's what I would say on that particular issue. So, Dr. Deviti, I have uh, read the paper written by Terry Maleski, as well as I have read the letter mm -hmm. uh, posted on that website. So in this environment, when Terry Maleski says that Khalistan, a project of Pakistan, do you agree with him? Let's point out uh, a much more important fact, and that is all the demands for Khalistan only center on the Punjab part, which is in India. Whereas the majority of the Sikhs religious sites, historical sites, are in the Pakistan side of the border. If you are, if you are looking at his, this problem historically, I'll just take two minutes to elaborate on this. Let's look at some basic facts. The, in, before partition, the Punjab was a, a mix of uh, Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, uh, other groups. What was, the, what, was the, what was the division of the population? 53% were Muslim. 29% were Hindus. 15% were Sikhs, right? That was the distribution of the population. Where did the Sikhs come to at partition? They came to India. They didn't go to Afghanistan. They, somebody gone, they didn't go to Iran. They didn't go to India. They came to India because that was their home. And India openly accepted the Sikhs, right? Now, they claim, Khalistani proponents claim that they're very badly treated and things have happened. And no doubt the, the, the pogroms in, in after Mrs. Gandhi was, was uh, uh, you know, assassinated did take place. And that's a very sorry state in the history of India. Three, 4,000 innocent people were killed. But hold on, historically, 250,000 Sikhs were killed at partition and the time in, in the pogroms that, that happened there. Nobody talks about this in the Sikh community. That's a real genocide. Not to, not to dis, the, the, not the, the loss of life, any loss of life is horrible. But 250,000 versus 4,000, there's a hell of a difference there. Now, people claim that Sikhs you know, are, are, are badly treated in India and Punjab, so they need their own homeland. Claiming that, let's look at some of the facts. We've had a, a person of Sikh origin as the president of the country, Dr. Zayal Singh. We've had a Sikh prime minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Many judges of the Supreme Court. 
most of our army and navy commanders have been Sikh. Being 2% of the population, their contribution, the military, economically, socially, culturally, are far outweigh the percentage they are in population because they're hard work. They've always been a very hardworking population. Now, if you have a Khalistan, what is it that you're complaining about? Can you name one person in Pakistan's, they've had Sikhs, there were 2 million at partition, they're less than 10,000 today, right? Which Sikh politician in Pakistan comes to mind, right? But when do we see the pro-Khalistani groups demonstrating and, and, and calling Pakistan out when Gurdwaras are attacked, when Pakistani women are raped, and there is forced conversion of, of Sikhs to, to Islam. I haven't seen any demonstrations from the Sikh community on that, right? Have you? So that, that in itself points out to me that there's a huge, there's a very strong nexus between Pakistan and, and the Khalistani movement. I mean, um, if you are talking about a Khalistan state, uh, uh, Punjab for Sikhs, as one of the Russians. Why are the most holy sites not involved in that? Because they're in Pakistan. Why are, are is the Khalistani movement not asking for Lahore, the capital of, of uh, uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh in, in the Sikh empire? Why are they not asking for the birthplace of Guru Nanak? You, out, because in my humble opinion, if they asked for that, they cannot make that sort of call in Pakistan. They, they, they would be uh, severely curtailed in, in support. So there is definitely a lot of this, um, the, these sort of factors which, which play uh, very much in, or, or which started with Terry Maliski's report. A website, Sikh Scholars Response, published a letter condemning McDonald Laurier Institute report. Khalistan, a project of Pakistan. 50 signatories of that letter include few Canadian Sikh academia and rest from US, Europe, and other parts of the world. But Terry Mileski never said in his paper that the whole Sikh community is bad. He mentioned a very tiny percentage of extremists are playing this extremist agenda this sort of this sort of political correctness is is, is absolutely wrong and we've suffered from it for at least three, two or three decades in Canada and in all Western democracies okay let me let me uh, I, I don't know if you're reading but Edmund Burke the Irish politician had a very nice phrase and he said that all that is necessary for Eve for this for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And in today's world, I'd say for good people to do nothing. Well, you know what? When you go to a Gurdwara or a, func a Sikh function and, you know, convicted terrorists are being honored, you know, you may be, I mean, and you, and you don't speak up against it, you are tactically then supporting those terrorists. That does not mean that you know, the community has bad. You know, you have to roti or beti ki sawal hai. The link between Hindus and Sikhs is roti beti ki sawal hai. Hum log saadi aapas mein karte hain, khana baith ke kaate hain, kisi, any, you go to any gurdwara, you go to any temple, you will see Sikhs and Hindus in both. Sikhs come to Hindu temples to pray, or uh, in, Hindus go to Sikh temples, mata technically jate hain. Right? That, that's the relationship. 99% of Sikhs in, in, in any country, not just Canada, are extremely hardworking, successful, law-abiding citizens, right? No, that 1% which is causing the problems, right, that is maligning the whole community. At no point in this report does Terry Miliski say that Sikhs are, he's maligning Sikhs. So that is patently false what the, what they're if they if that's what they're saying because I haven't read the letter right he's saying that a small percentage of, of, of people who are who have been uh, let's say uh, engaged in illegal activities are are, 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 are are wrong and should be and should be held to account and, and let's look at the facts you know the Khalistani movement pretty well in Punjab is a dead movement 
right? In the last election, who won? Doctor, I mean, Amrinder, Captain Amrinder Singh, who's a who's who is very who's a first of all is a Congress person. So the Congress won, despite the history of the Congress uh, led pogroms against against Sikhs in 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 Delhi in the past, right? He's a he's a very staunch uh, anti Khalistani person, right? The the more than that, most of the seats that were Sikhs had majorities in Punjab went to Captain Amrinder Singh's Congress party. What was the vote share of the Shia, of the Shia, of the Shimana Kali Dal splinter group, which asked for Khalistan? 0.34%. 0.34%. So where is the support in, the, in, 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 in India and Punjab for, for pro-Khalistani movement? There is none. The fact of the matter is that this has been an issue in Canada, in UK, in USA for expatriate Sikhs to have a role to play. Okay, I, 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 I mean, I don't know what their financial situation is, but it is it is obviously not a con not of concern in India, not of concern the state of Punjab. They're not willing to fight this battle in Pakistan, where most of the sites of the Sikh empire were right, because Pakistan would not permit it. India being a democracy permits debate and Canada being a democracy permits you to express your point of view, which is fine. Don't engage in terrorist activities. That's okay. Use your, you do what you would, would like to do. Demonstrate, uh, have placards, whatever. But please, 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 my, my request to every, to every person, thinking person, do not back terrorists. Do, someone who bombed Air India and killed 329 innocent people does not deserve your respect and does not reserve your obeisance in a Gurdwara. It's, there's, this is not a place for him. Uh, it's as simple as that. So, I have seen the names of all uh, signatories in that letter. I haven't seen anyone's uh, criticizing human rights abuses in Pakistan, particularly Sikh and uh, Hindu girls' uh, forced conversion, their forced marriages in Pakistan. But in this letter, they also state that they happen to condemn human rights abuses in Pakistan. But I don't hear anything uh, criticizing Pakistan in terms of persecution of Sikhs and Hindus there, neither from Mr. Pannu nor from other Khalistani leader. So why don't they criticize uh, human rights abuses in Pakistan? That's an excellent question. I wish I had the answer. I think you have to ask the people who are signatories to that report. But this has become a growing trend, not just in Canada, but in all liberal democracies. There seems to be a feeling that, you know what, everybody's belief system is above reproach. You accept it and you move on. Well, wait a minute, not every belief system is okay, right? When you say that, for instance, when do you see uh, uh, people, you know, people complaining about the lack of rights in many Muslim origin countries? There are abuses still today, but nobody talks about it. It's okay, right? Nobody talks about, like you were mentioning in Pakistan, where, why aren't people demonstrating in the streets with the, with the internment of, of, the, of the Uyghur Muslims in China? So the, this is this whole debate depending on w w what you want to discuss, is a pick and choose type debate. This, con this, is, this, this suits my argument, so here I will speak on human rights. This doesn't suit my, my argument because it's a friend of mine or a country that is leaving, so I won't discuss that part. I mean, what sort of nonsense is this, right? I mean, just recently we've had the, the execution of uh, the wrestler in Iran, right? Where are, where are the people in the streets about that? Where are the people in the streets about that? When, 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 when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, some 80-year-old person marrying a six-year-old girl, and it's in the news, where are our feminist sisters and, and, and people who are talking about human rights for, for children, right? They talk about child trafficking. This is blatant uh, abuse of a child. But I don't see the people in the street about this issue because it doesn't concern them. It's far away. And this is wrong. Pick your battles on the basis of whether there's abuse or not abuse, not because it suits your political political agenda, right? That's what I would uh, I would request everyone to examine their conscience and speak on issues of what is right and wrong, and not what suits their political agenda. 
I, when it I'll comes to when it comes to Canadian Sikh politicians, some are even our ministers. They criticize India's any uh, step what they think is uh, human right uh, uh, abuse. But even our Canadian Sikh politicians, they don't criticize Pakistan's persecution of Sikh, Hindu, and Christian communities. What would you say on this situation? Well, you know, uh, my father once told me that in a democracy, only two things count. Either you provide money for campaigns or you bring voters to vote. And unfortunately, it's been made obvious to me on many occasions that if a group of people can win, bring money and votes to a party, then it's, it's people get silenced a fair bit and they don't want to speak out. And the best example of this would be the change in, in, in Ralph Goodale's time of the report on uh, uh, CSIS report. The liberals did that because, of, because a lot of their funding uh, from, what, from the National Post articles is coming from BC. Fine. But the Conservative Party had a motion criticizing that. And, 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 and I, I believe Aaron O'Toole was one of the sponsors of that motion. And yet that motion didn't see the light of day. But the pro-Khalistani group in the Sikh community led an email and telephone campaign. And that motion, criticizing Justin Trudeau's government, uh, or our, our government at the time, liberal government, was quietly withdrawn. So why was that? Because the perception it seems to be in Canadian politics that the pro Khalistani group in Canada can deliver you both money and votes in, in significant numbers in certain swing ridings, and therefore you cannot go against what they are saying. Now, that's wrong. That is just blatantly wrong. That means that uh, our democracy is being held hostage to certain instant certain interest groups this is what it, it points out to me now how can uh, a, let's say if, if Sikhs represent half a million people of Sikh origin are in Canada if this group is maybe 10 15 20 thousand I don't know the exact number but how can such a small number of people dictate what the two major federal parties are, 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 are discussing for the benefit of all Canadians and dictate policy, you know? And I won't go with Jagmeet Singh and NDP. I don't, you know, I've never seen him criticize anything. I mean, he just criticized the police for something which he shouldn't have in Toronto that happened. But I mean, that sort of thing is just blatantly wrong. Democracy is supposed to be a situation where you look at the, the best interests of the majority of your citizens. Right? That's the fundamental basis of democracy. Not to say the majority is always right. And there you have to use your judgment and say, well, this is not right, so we're not going to support this even though the majority want it. Um, that also is a, is a fact of democracy. But I have never seen a, a, such a small number of people dictating to major political parties what their policies should be. I have not. So what do you see the future of politics in Canada in this environment, do you see any hope in terms of any change that the political parties could come out of this tribalism kind of a thing? Well, there, there, I don't, you're probably aware, you, more than I am being a journalist, that there has been a move to discuss proportional representation uh, and change the system of the, of the first past the post, first uh, past the post system that we have. That is one thing which unfortunately has not been very, very uh, beneficial to both Israel and Italy where this post, where this, this is the system, um, because uh, again, you have issues with how the system works. But I think the biggest task is that uh, Canadian politicians and Canadian political parties must educate themselves on issues and look at the broader picture 
and look at a, at something that instead of being uh, looking at it as a uh, selfish venture, how many votes will I get, how much money comes into the party's coffers, look at it, is this beneficial for Canada? Is this what the majority of my constituents would want me to say? Right? I mean, I think if you discuss some of the, some of the statements people have made uh, in the past, they're responding to a small number of constituents in their writing. The job of an elected MP or MLA or MPP is to represent the majority of his constituents, not a small number of them. And if that viewpoint is not the viewpoint of the majority of his constituents, then he should bloody well find out what is the majority viewpoint in that constituency he represents. Because that's the oath that they take, to represent the majority of their constituents both in, in Parliament and in what they say and what they do. They're not there to represent just the view, the small, very small, most vocal members of their constituency. So maybe one of the positive changes I would I would recommend is, if you're an MP or an MPP, please know what do 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 polling. The technology is there; it costs very little. Poll your constituents on a particular issue before you issue a public statement or take a public stand in Parliament. That might be a good way to know where, which you know, what people expect from you, instead of relying on the te on the five, ten people who come in your office and raise particular issues. So, in the end, I like to know more about uh, this reality that. Uh, in this environment of uh, political correctness and appeasement uh, politics, do you really see any chance or any hope on the ground for any change? Well, Tehirbhai, it's very simple. You get the government that you deserve, right? If individual Canadians, and I, I'm not just to indicate, but individual Canadians do not take an interest in, in how things are done, do not show up to riding association meetings, do not educate themselves in the political process, they have no one to blame but themselves. Somebody is going to fill that political vacuum, right? And if you're going to say, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, oh, I, I'm too tired to go to that meeting. Oh, I don't want to sign the check for uh, for this um, party or this particular candidate. Well, then, you know, we're going to have issues like this. We have elections where 52 percent, you know, sometimes even less than 2 percent show up to vote on an election night. I mean, come on, you know, this is this is ridiculous. You know, in a democracy, democracy is a two-way street. It gives citizens certain um, uh, responsibilities, okay, and care, and we can change the government when we're not happy with the government. That's, that's our right as citizens. But it's also our responsibility as citizens of Canada, okay, to participate in the process. You cannot just accept the goodies that are coming from the country and not accept your responsibilities as a citizen to be informed of the situation that's going on and to actively participate. If you part do not participate in the process, you are leaving the field open to those who will. And trust me, people with a particular agenda, whether it's economic, social, political, whatever, are going to participate in the process and they will dominate the political discussion and the political landscape. This is what happens. You know, and, and it comes back to, to Ed, Edmund Burke. If, if people who are knowledgeable, who are, who, are, who, are, who, are, who, are, who are interested, don't participate, well, the fringe will. And the fringe has, and they have been dominating our our political process. Whether it's the whether it's conservatives, whether it's liberals, whether it's NDP, every political party that who, who the support is based on people who are extremely active, who take part in the process. You know, you sit at home, sorry, you don't have your say, but then don't complain. Don't complain afterwards, oh, you know, the, they, they're not representing my viewpoint. Well, where were you when it came time to give your political contribution or participate in the meeting to put forward your viewpoint? 
right? Put forward your viewpoint. You know, write, you know, speak to the MP, speak to the MLA's office or whatever, and say this is right or this is wrong. If you don't participate in the process, for God's sake, then don't criticize what the process is. So finally, Dr. Dwayti, if you think we are missing any important message or any important uh, content in our conversation, what you and I just had, kindly say so. I, I would just, I would summarize what I, what I finished with. And that is that my, my humble request to everyone who listens and, wa and watches your program, Please take the time to participate in the process of democracy. Democracy is dependent on the active participation of its citizenry. If the citizens abdicate that responsibility, then we are to blame for what the political statements and policies come out. It's as simple as that. If you don't participate in a democracy, then don't criticize what's happening. You know, and, and, and right and wrong decisions are taken because there's too much influence by small interest groups. Apart from the Khalistani issue, small interest groups are dominating the politics, not just here, also in, also in the United States, in France, in Germany, uh, in the, all sorts of countries. And it happens because the majority of the citizens do not take the time to participate in the process and speak out when evil happens. Evil only happens when good people do nothing. It's as simple as that. Thank you very much, Dr. Devedi, for joining us today. Thank you for watching Candid Talk with Tahir Gora and Dr. Devedi. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.